Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the human beings behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future, and future creators, and all those like great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your exponential health, aging, and longevity ambassador, along for this journey today. So uh, on today's show, we are going to continue uh, upon a theme that we started a few weeks ago, uh, and that is basically how in today's world and the near future, uh, which is facing this major demographic shift. Uh, we talked about how by 2050, the estimated population of those 65 plus will represent around 20% of the global population with an estimated 500 million octogenarian and above. Uh, ultimately, how do we continue to foster innovations to deal with the population aging that is needless to say, uh, going to impose significant strains on economies, health systems, social structures worldwide, and uh, how in this world of amazing pockets of wealth do we make sure some of it, uh, outside of the traditional models like science, venture capital, private equity, and so forth, begin to get channeled uh, to the next generation of breakthroughs and healthy longevity so that all of us can benefit. Uh, our guest today is, is truly a, a thought leader's thought leader on the topic and, and needs no introduction for those that spend time in the area of biomedical sciences. Uh, Dr. Victor Zhao uh, is the president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine of the United States National Academy of Sciences, uh, and most recently prior to that, served as the president and CEO of Duke University Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Zhao is a leading cardiovascular scholar. He was the Hersey Professor of Theory and Practice of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, served as the chairman of the Department of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, Brigham Women's Hospital, and chairman of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. Uh, previously, he was the chairman of National Institutes of Health Cardiovascular Disease Advisory Committee and also served as advisory committee to the director of the NIH. Uh, Dr. Zhao has made significant impact on medicine through seminal research in cardiovascular medicine and genetics, uh, pioneering work in the area of vascular medicine, and his leadership in healthcare innovation. Um, his seminal research uh, laid the foundation of the development of the ACE inhibitors, or the angiotensin converting enzyme drugs, which are now used globally for the treatment of uh, high blood pressure and patient heart failure. Uh, he pioneered gene therapy technologies in vascular disease. And ultimately, <laughs> under his leadership at uh, National Academy of Medicine, Dr. Zhao has organized and implemented both the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity, which is an international commission that will assess available evidence and recommend strategies for global societies to maintain health and longevity uh, in aging populations, oh, but also the Healthy Longevity Global Competition, which is a $30 million program uh, that endeavors to kickstart innovation to support healthy longevity through a series of monetary awards and prizes. Uh, all that being said, Dr. Zhao, thank you for taking the time today to come on the show. Thank you, and uh, that's quite a mouthful. Uh, for that introduction. I wish my mother was here to listen to this. She finally believe I've done something useful. Well, I, I could have gone on for an hour, but uh, yeah, all, yeah. All, all that being said, um, I, there's, there's really, really no one in, in my seg, our segment here, Biomedicine, that doesn't know your name. But for those that are going to be listening and watching the show that uh, are outside of uh, our sphere, can you take a few minutes just to sure. introduce yourself, you know, how you developed an interest in medicine and cardiology? and ultimately a bit of the path to why the topic of healthy longevity in 2020 has become so important. To sure. You. First of all, let me say that what a great honor for me to be speaking to, you know, your audience, and what an honor for me to be working in this country. I'm an immigrant. I was born in China, came when I was age 18 to study college, and this country has been wonderful to me. And so when I think about this issue, uh, you characterize it as, as some people call it a silver tsunami. Mm -hmm. This big tsunami coming at us, as you appropriately pointed out, it will probably create a lot of stress and strain in our society, with regards to healthcare, burden of disease, economic issues, et cetera. But I also like to say this is an opportunity. Think about the following. If we did the right thing, and we keep people healthy. This whole population would be so productive and being able to do so many important things that would drive, in fact, the society's future. And it's always been said that people are older, studies, social studies have shown they're wiser, mm -hmm. uh, they certainly have a lot more experience, and generally they're happier. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities here what we face with, of course, is, our, is whether our societies prepare for them, whether we set the right environment, the right policy to enable them to be healthy and functional, 
and whether we are actually using, as you said, that innovation to create the science and technology that can mm -hmm. be really healthy as they age. That's the whole purpose, certainly in my mind, of the National Academy's medicines focus, the whole focus on healthy longevity. Working along that theme, um, you know, as mentioned, um, we as a biomedical um, system, uh, you know, pour a tremendous amount every year into, into all sorts of research. I think, you know, big pharma, biotech spends a couple of hundred billion dollars a year, tens of billions more in life science, private equity. Yet we have these uh, areas, as you know, called unmet medical needs. Um, you know, I, I did a show recently on, on the topic of uh, tuberculosis, which, you know, straight, I, I did not realize 1.6 million dead every year still from, and, and we're using antibiotics from the, still from the 1940s. Could you talk a little bit more about why these models, competitions, challenges, prizes, uh, and so forth, are so crucial uh, in this era where we still have, and I think many would say, longevity is still probably the largest of all there the unmet medical needs. Yeah, so let's put it this way. Um, on the point I just made, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the statistics today, 2020, there are now more people over 65 globally mm -hmm. than under age five. That's, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be even more as a fertility drops, people are having fewer kids, as people like me and others are living longer, right? Mm -hmm. I think, but I like to see this as a full opportunity because what some people call a silver economy. Mm -hmm. Let's think about the, the, the number of people who are consuming, who are doing things, who are driving the economy. This is a huge one. And yet I think our focus in most of our research innovation around the younger people, around diseases. Mm -hmm. Health span is the critical issue. So let me come back to your question. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, if I had to walk down Harvard, Stanford, Duke, Michigan, and ask an average scientist, what do you work on? They say, I work on cancer. I work on cardiovascular disease. I work on the brain. Very few would say I work on aging, mm -hmm. right? And aging is a biologic process. Right. It can be studied. And importantly, once you know the process of aging, you can intervene with it not different than what we're doing in cancer, many other areas, and maybe it's even easier, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to shift from mentality of disease focus to health focus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To looking at how to treat disease already there versus how to enhance your health and health span mm -hmm. for you to prevent disease. So that's point number one. So not enough people are thinking along aging, a lot more people working in other areas, and not enough people thinking about health, a lot of people working on disease. Mm -hmm. One of the problems. The second problem is the way in which we encourage um, scientific discovery innovation. Let's take the largest funding agency in the world on biomedical science, NIH. So what do we think about this? I'm still an NIH investigator. I've got two NIH grants. I know how to write those grants. Mm -hmm. Don't write anything with a bold idea. I'm gonna write them an idea to say it's feasible and I got preliminary data. Mm -hmm. so people know by the time you put the idea forward, you already have done a third of the work so that people convince that what they bet on you is likely to yield to results, but they're not bold. Right. If I had a bold idea, I know I'd be shot out of the water in a nanosecond. <laughs> Great idea, but how do you know we can do this? Right. I think to begin with, we're too conservative. The way that we encourage science innovation, people don't come up with bold ideas as much as incremental ideas. That's doable. And what I think we need in the field of bold ideas really is something that's totally different. You mentioned several hundred billion dollars spent in pharma. Think about Alzheimer's. Have we come up with anything? Not really. Because we're all focused on one hypothesis. Beta amyloid, beta amyloid, right? And spend tons of money versus what else is out there that we haven't thought of, right? So I think that's a second problem is, well, third or fourth problem for that matter, right? 
Mm -hmm. We emphasize in science how we encourage innovation, bold ideas, and how, in fact, we are too focused on disease and on disease pathway versus looking at their fundamental biological processes. I think all this creates a very conservative environment where your bets are going to be, you know, a lot more conservative. Mm -hmm. So you come up with one drug, one target, one mechanism, and therefore one disease, right? I mean, if you look at a science uh, strategy today, uh, it's becoming a thousand orphan drugs. Mm -hmm. Every pathway, which is small, is likely a biologic, is likely to be approved because you're around a single uh, small disease and versus thinking about more broadly, how do we improve the health span? Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. And what we're trying to do is to try to change the paradigm and try to encourage a lot of bold, innovative thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's the idea behind the grand challenge. That being said, could you talk a little bit about um, the history of it? I mean, obviously, uh, you, you had your, um, you know, the launch uh, a couple of months ago in Washington, D.C., and you have really, uh, you brought together a group of stakeholders, investors, I mean, government, big pharma, researchers from, from all over the world. Were there challenges, surprises um, in that process in sort of getting everybody on board? And then ultimately, if you could just sort of walk through, you know, how the process works. If you know, I'm yes, a scientist absolutely. in my lab, you know, how do I, how do I contact you and, you know, <laughs> apply? You know, Ira, I, you're spot on. Yeah. You mentioned we got together scientists, academia, funding agency, pharma, foundations, and live experience and patients, et cetera. You, everybody work together. No longer can you look at it in a silo fashion. You want to bring, to bring public private partnership together. That's the idea we have behind the grand challenge, which is let's think out of the box and get as many people or stakeholders to work together to mm -hmm. solve this problem. Second is how do you solve this problem? Well, we're going to give money to people who are bold and innovative. We're not asking for uh, a lot of data mm -hmm. or good ideas, right? And so we borrow this model from the Gates Foundation Grand Challenge Exploration. Okay. They actually look at how to solve malaria problems, et cetera. And they give out, you know, awards of $50,000, you name it, to get a lot of global entrepreneurs and thinkers to say, I can solve the problem from this direction or that direction, this direction, without proscribing. What pathway do you need to work on or how do you need to approach this issue? So our idea on this grant challenge is to give out a lot of small 50,000 seed grants. Now that's not a small amount of money in some countries in the world. Right. And it stays there may be small. But we're also not constrained by biology. And those, we understand biologic sciences are more expensive, but still, I think biologic sciences are absolutely important. But think about digital sciences, mm -hmm. the, the robotics, the autonomous uh, you know, uh, 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 technology, and many others. And we also understand social science is so important. Mm -hmm. Look at the elderly, how healthy they are, isolation you know, interaction, purpose of life, really in many ways in, uh, influence their health. So we say, look, we're not going to be constrained by any field. Social science, engineering, digital science, uh, biologic science, medicine, etc. We're going to be open to everybody. Mm -hmm. And we encourage people to work together, convergence. So this $50,000, 450 such grants across the world, mm. but uh, eight funding agencies covering about 49 countries and territories. So China, UK, EU, uh, United States, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, and others are all part of this global movement, if you will, to get a lot of the people interested in the field. So first of all, you end up with a lot more people working in aging. Mm -hmm. A lot of people with new ideas say, hey, you know, there's an opportunity for us to throw some new ideas. And we review the grant very differently. 
rather than the standard stud study section that says, you know, long write up and whole bit. We ask for people short ones mm -hmm. and for the innovation. Obviously, we want to bet on it can work, but that is a starting point sure. of starting movement, right? Second, once you get one of these awards, we have another layer. The first layer is called Catalyst Award. Mm -hmm. It's called Accelerator Awards. We have European Investment Bank, Japan Ministry of uh, Economy, Trade, and Innovation, mm -hmm. NJ Laboratory, putting in millions of dollars in that middle level, whereby the winners not only come together once a year to exchange ideas, but they have the chance of being selected at the next level with support over a million dollars to help them get to uh, the next level and important commercialization because I certainly believe that until you can get to scale, mm -hmm. it's very helpful. So that we have actually, people are very excited about this because now there's a lot more shots on go, bold ideas, people get to pick their ideas, get to invest in them and get them to the next level. Mm. We have a grand prize like the X prize of several million dollars. Right now we raised four, okay. four to say the breakthrough gets the prize. Right. So, so far we have over $30 million in the Catalyst Award starting upwards. So it's very exciting. How do we come to this idea? Well, so when I took over at the then Institute of Medicine, now we call it National Academy of Medicine, you know, I thought, look, we should have be, we should be an organization that inspires the world on bold, audacious goals. So I started asking, what are those audacious goals? Well, you know, aside from the usual cancer, et cetera, guess what? We survey the public and we survey our members and aging come up to be very high. And we say, well, okay, so aging, yeah, indeed, this is a really important topic. You just said it, right? And your introductory remarks, how important this issue is, and yet there's not enough people working on it. So we found this is a space that we should be getting the world interested, starting a movement, getting mm -hmm. or investing in it and trying to make a difference. Further along with that, sort of the, the, the movement and the internationalization of this, uh, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had um, a George McGuinness uh, on the show uh, from UKRI talking about their version of the challenge. Um, Talk about how you know you see this further spreading. Because I mean, I obviously thirty million here, one hundred million here. That's wonderful. Um, and then I look at something like the um, the Global Fund for HIV, TB, yep. malaria. You know, they're spending what now a couple billion dollars a year. When do you see phase two, or whatever you want to call it? Because obviously, you know, this longevity thing, as you mentioned, Alzheimer's alone. I don't know how much big pharma has thrown at that in the last twenty years tens, if not hundreds of billions. Um, is this going to get to the level soon, like the Global Fund, where we're not going to be talking about tens of millions, but talking about billions every year towards healthy longevity, because it is such a large yeah. amount. Uh, no question, Ira. First of all, uh, with regards to George McGuinness, we're working with him. Mm -hmm. In fact, UKRI is part of our partners on this sure. challenge. And uh, Mark Walpole was on our committee. Mm -hmm. He's the head of UKRI, and he jumped right in and say, of course, we're going to support this. So it's starting this with increasing awareness. It, you know, at the end of the day, when you talk about money, it depends how you measure it. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of money going into it. Sure. Like you just said it. The question is, is it spent appropriately? Right. I think what we're trying to do is to shine a light and change the way we think about the need to put the money more into bolder ideas and not the traditional thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you use it? Right. So I think this actually will get the attention if a couple of, you know, we expect a lot of failures, but the whole idea is to have a lot of innovation at the same time, right? right. So if you imagine that, if that that much output that can demonstrate how successful this is, I'll bet you people flock to do this, right? Uh, as you say, very similar to some of the other big funds, which are disease-oriented, mm -hmm. and uh, Gavi and others. But I say this one would be a much broader mandate. So that's point number one. Um, I think we're, we're behind the United States. 
if you travel the world, you know that Japan is really thinking about this. Mm -hmm. They know the aging population. The life expectancy is, 70, is 84 years old. And ours is about 70 now, as you know, going downwards to about 76, right? 84 means that a lot of people are living to 90, 100, right? If you consider the, you know, early childhood sure. and all the accidents, stuff like that. So they are really focused on this. Singapore, the whole country is making this a major focus. And the whole wave that comes after some of these countries, for example, Southeast Asia, they're only 10 years behind. Soon they'll be all reaching 65. And our country is already seeing, I mean, we are, we are only where we are because we have a lot of immigration. Mm -hmm. Just to dampen the, you know, the kind of age demographic issues, right? So I think that countries are waking up, our country needs to wake up. And I have a feeling that as we move this forward, there'll be a lot of interest once we prove that this works. And the billion dollars are gonna, I would say they'll come. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that there are discussion in different arena mm -hmm. about, as you can imagine, uh, taking a long-term investment in research this area, sure. like a 30-year bond, multi-billion dollar bonds to enable people to come in to say, we invest in this, the output in a number of years will be phenomenal globally. Mm -hmm. Because not only can we actually help you get healthier, and therefore we can meet in fact, the labor workforce, if you will, over time, but also reduce the cost of care, you know, the big burden, as you point, pointed out, and many others. So I think this is all going to come. You know, your, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, your uh, research career, your research history in the area of cardiology, uh, you've you've touched on many uh, different technologies over the years. You obviously, you, you uh, spawned the sort of the ACE inhibitor era, you've worked in gene therapies, some of your current work, you know, you work in uh, cardiac transdifferentiation and, and some really bleeding edge stuff. Um, obviously, you're running the show and, and a part of the whole process, but um, if Victor, it, it, if you just said, you know what, I'm going back to the lab tomorrow, I'm just gonna <laughs> spend my time there. Are there certain technological areas um, that you are more excited about, extremely excited about in the terms yeah. of healthy longevity R&D, personally, um, uh, looking sure. forward. Not, not to yeah. say that Alzheimer's is an important cancer. And yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what are you more, <laughs> most excited about looking okay. about 10 to 15? So I'm a cardiologist. Sure. So uh, just to, uh, to give you a mild correction, I still run the lab. I've got two NIH grants. Sure, sure. So I can tell you what I'm working on. Uh, as you know, the myocardium, the human heart, cannot regenerate. Right. Uh, it has limited capacity. If you're younger, maybe better, mm -hmm. and hair better. If you're older, once you have a heart attack, the heart muscle dies. There's really no ability to regenerate those heart muscles. The more recent, as you know, uh, controversy that turns out that people are now fairly clear, there are no stem cells in the heart that can allow the heart to regenerate. So a lot of people have tried to put in stem cells in the heart, but it doesn't work because the cells don't graft. Mm -hmm. We've been working on the idea of direct reprogramming. So what is it? Well, some years ago, I would say about seven years ago, I think, Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize sure. for being able to show that you can take a human skin fibroblast, a cell that makes uh, collagen and connective tissue, they form scars. That skin cell can be converted to a stem cell by simply genetically reprogramming it. Introduce mm -hmm. some genes which tell the cells that you should be an embryonic stem cell. And guess what? He's been able to successfully. And so many people are now taking these cells and to say, now that we can make uh, stem cells from you yourself, uh, from your skin, we can now tell those cells to convert into tissues. Mm. As I mentioned, it still doesn't work very well if you just put it into the heart or elsewhere. So our, our idea is to borrow from Yamanaka's idea that you can genetically tell a cell being one type to another. So we tell the skin cells or fibroblasts to be heart muscle cells. So we found a way by which we use what we call microRNA 
a combination of microRNA that can tell a fibroblast to become muscle cells. Mm. Able to do it in vitro and we can be able to do it in vivo. So imagine that you had a heart attack. The first thing, your response would be inflammation, cell death. Following that, you form a scar. And the scar formations by activation, these fibroblasts, they divide, they lay down collagen. And what we are able to do is to tell those replicating fibroblasts, instead of becoming fibroblasts, why don't you become muscle cells? Mm -hmm. So suddenly we are regenerating hot muscle cells from the fibroblasts and we have successfully done so. We've done it in mouse studies, we have published, we now in the midst of trying to do in large animal studies and to look at whether it's possible to regenerate heart muscle by simply introducing small molecules in the heart after heart attack. Mm -hmm. Why you don't have heart failure, but you have regeneration. So that's what I'm working on. Now, if you think about what I've been saying about aging, of course, heart attack is a expression of uh, the aging process, right? Mm -hmm. Atherosclerosis, heart attack, heart failure. But I still argue that our longevity, health longevity grand challenge should be focused on preventing even heart attacks. Mm. Very early looking at their biologic pathways. Many investigators are finding how important the mitochondria is, some of the cellular pathways are important to maintain the cells being healthy. Mm -hmm. People know about telomeres, right? Maintain them at the right length so cells won't die. And so those are the very promising areas that should be worked on. I want to move on to just a couple uh, of your other initiatives at the National Academy of Medicine. And, and one of these, um, you, you under your leadership, you've been involved in convening a, uh, an international commission on uh, heritable or clinical use of heritable uh, human genome editing. Uh, and, and gene editing, and we've discussed a bit on the show in the past, different therapeutic perspectives, um, you know, obviously a very hot topic, whether we're talking about CRISPR or some of these other next generation tools um, for what we'll call therapeutics, potentially for later in life. But at the same time, uh, there has been quite a bit, well, hopefully not quite a bit, but it's rogue uh, germline genome editing that has been going on. And, and just in the last week, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Heejin Kyu from uh, China was, was sentenced to prison for three years for uh, some of the work he did. Um, I know you and, and, and Dr. Uh, Margaret Hamburg, the former FDA commissioner, have spoken on various panels regarding these topics. Could you just talk a little bit about uh, sort of where we are in 2020 with regard to uh, the use of some of these tools, as you see, potentially for uh, some of you know, the, sure. uh, the, the, the regenerative medicine indications. And then also if you could speak just, I mean, I, I know it's a sort of a, a fringe group, but there are uh, components of the, the biohacking, uh, we'll call the transhumanist community that view uh, doctors like Dr. He as, as heroes in the sense that they may have done something very bad, but they're taking steps that, you know, whether it's certain inheritable diseases or what have you, that we can get out of the genome potentially and so forth. Can you just speak a little bit about sure. Nan's position well, and sort of where we're going? Ira, you ask great questions. And Thank you. <laughs> you. I mean, you are very thoughtful. I think you know the landscape. I think the big issue, let's not deal with genome editing first. Let's deal with the larger issue of science and technology. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it is amazing where we're seeing in terms of the progress on technology. I would say that, you know, I think in all of humanity, we've never seen such rapid advancement in science technology. Take the iPhone, 10, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I can live without it. It's like my peripheral brain mm -hmm. and you can do some things with it. Genome editing, right? Now you can actually, you know, precisely remove a gene that you don't want and like a good gene, right? Artificial intelligence, right? And it goes on and on. I think the big issue, maybe another, love to have another panel with you on this issue is, what are we doing about society is doing in making sure that these technology, which are so transformative, that I absolutely believe in and support, however, don't have unintended consequences. They're huge, right? right. And if you look at, well, just randomly talk about CAR T therapy, you know, that immunotherapy is saving lives and curing disease, but who can afford it? Mm -hmm. 
fifty thousand dollars of treatment, right? And uh, yet, if you look at hepatitis C drugs, the people are arguing how expensive it is, eighty thousand. But if you look at the number of people whose lives are going to be cured with uh, hepatitis C and no liver transplant and cirrhosis, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a lot of money up front. But how do you save it in the long run, right? And if you look at the ethics of all those issues and equity and affordability, um, social norms and regulation, mm -hmm. a lot of work ahead of us, right? Sure. So uh, this is an area that the Academy is putting a lot of time into. We're gonna launch a commission, a committee, the end of this month with some of the most brilliant minds in the area of uh, medicine, engineering, social science, ethics, economics, regulation, law, and technology, both digital as well as, as biotechnology, and even investors. Mm -hmm. Because these technologies that come out from a lab, like when I talked about what I'm doing, mm -hmm. quickly, therefore, you can see the upside very quickly. Sure. But what happens usually is people are coming in to say, aha, you know what? There's a real opportunity to bring it to human. There's a market there, and we want to therefore provide you resources to start really scaling up and eventually becoming a real product, right? But it's at this phase of discussion, when you begin to think about how to get to human, there ought to be a conversation about what is the implication of this technology on all the other issues. It's mm -hmm. the implication of society. And I would think that we need a framework for this kind of discussion very early. In a way, you say with genome. Genome editing is about ethics. It's about uh, also uh, access and equity. Mm -hmm. So very early, such discussions should be occurring as we are now talking about genome editing. But there are many other technologies. Synthetic biology, we can now synthesize any organism. 3D printing, you name it, right? So right. things ought to be discussed in some framework and then figuring out how to bring it to society in such a way that people can have access to it, they can afford it, and that we mitigate any unintended consequences. Things like privacy, like look at what happened to Facebook and came mm -hmm. political, things like that, which I think is now very big right now today because of where science and technology is moving so fast. Excellent points. That's a whole discussion. No, now, yeah, we... <laughs> so back to genome editing. I think that that technology is amazing. I think it's transformative. Imagine that you can actually remove a gene you don't like precisely, and then you may even be replaced with a better gene. Mm -hmm. The removing of disease-causing gene is important, right? So I think the application that is most people are excited about is what they call somatic. Genome editing, mm -hmm. again, taking cells, tissues from your body to introduce the CRISPR technology to remove the disease gene, and therefore you're going to function much better. That somatic therapy, uh, I think, is already ongoing in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I believe it will come to you know, human application and market sooner or later. Now, the reason we feel comfortable with this is because you're not trying to change your embryo or your stem cells, and you're not influencing your genetic makeup for population generations. Right. You're only treating you, the patient. You only put it into tissue that you need to treat with disease. And you're not trying to change your sperm, your egg, and your embryo, et cetera. And also because FDA, you know, we already have a good regulatory process. You can't bring these things to a human without going through FDA. Right. It's a product regulation. So efficacy, safety, all those parameters are fairly well known. The controversial area, as you know, is are two things. One is the embryo uh, germline, they call germline gene editing. That is that you're editing now at the level of the egg, the sperm, or the embryo, or the germline. Once you edited the genome in that one, you're passing down generations in which that gene is forever changed and altered. 
So people are arguing, are we ready to do something like this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, are we actually ready to start changing this? So some people argue, well, if you have a devastating disease that's not treatable, you should use it. Other people argue, yeah, but you may open the Pandora's box yeah. of beginning to change the human genome altogether. The big concern, of course, is the second area called gene enhancement. Mm. You know, many of these technology, when you treat disease, most people can say, yeah, I can get it. But when you say, well, I'm going to make you smarter, better looking, or whatever, and you don't really need it, but you know what? You're going to have an edge over others. Now you're talking about designer babies, and mm -hmm. the controversy is. Now, in Dr. J.K. Kerr, his problem is he jumped the gun so quickly because lots of things are unknown at this point. Mm -hmm. Is it safe? What happens long term to the babies? Uh, do we have precise technology? Have you gone through the ethical conversation? Is there oversight? And did you get the right consent? He bypassed all this. Mm -hmm. Deserve to be chastised, in my opinion, right? But one day when all these things are being clarified, which is what we're trying to do in the academy and our commission, as you mentioned, and Peggy Hamburg's doing it with WHO, mm -hmm. at some point this year, we'll have a report to say, this is what the experts say are the conditions you can consider or not. This is the way that you got to fulfill the criteria before you get to a human. And if you ever got to a human, it's still experimental. This is what you're going to have to follow, et cetera. These things have to be clear before you can jump the gun. Right. I think he jumped the gun, and probably for not good reasons. Hmm. One, one final area that I, I want to touch on, um, which I recently learned about, you know, you, um, National Academy of Medicine, uh, under your leadership, has also put together uh, what is known as the Action Collaborative on Clinician Well-Being and Resilience, uh, specifically focusing on a, a topic that I was quite unfamiliar with, but uh, known as clinician burnout. Uh, and obviously, we talk about a lot of wonderful technologies and products and services uh, coming down the road, but um, we need our clinicians to be there. <laughs> uh, we need them to want to stay in, in medicine and uh, to understand these technologies because they are going to be implementing them in this patient clinician relationship. Could you just talk briefly for a few minutes on sure. the topic yeah. of burnout? What's happening in 2020? Is it, is it solely based on sort of the financial structures of healthcare in the US? Are there other things happening that uh, the audience should know about? Because yeah. you know, we need the clinician. I think the audience needs to know this and we've been, as others, been trying to really shine a big light on this. Why? Because the statistics are pretty of great concern. Uh, 40 or more to 50% of physicians when surveyed have acknowledged one or more symptoms of burnout. And that means they are just simply, you know, don't care anymore. They are detached. They are overworked and they are depressed, etc. Doctors have a lot more depression than others. And also in suicide, they twice the suicide level, believe it or not, of physicians compared to the public, compared to people who are educated the same level. So in other words, you're not talking about, okay, the public is not all like doctors, but when you measure the level of education, level of income, physicians are having two to three times more suicide. Nurses, they have PTSD syndrome, uh, and particularly ICU nurses. And it turns out this is a very pervasive issue. So what's the problem here, right? The problem is, of course, as you pointed out, if your caregivers are not doing well, they affect the kind of work that they do. And the studies show that they make more mistakes and the quality of care is worse. I always say to you, Ira, if you tomorrow go into a plane and you're, you're into a 747, a pilot said to you, you know, Ira, I'm burned out. How do you feel? <laughs> You'll be very worried, right? Yeah, so this the is a problem. And you know what a reflection of is how, in fact, we are evolving our society. Kind of what we just talked about earlier. You know, a lot of heavy load demand. People are getting less satisfaction from their jobs. In the case of being a clinician, you know, people going there to take care of patients. Quickly, they find themselves 
working with electronic health record in front of computer, no time for patients. Uh, they, they have a huge amount of workload. Uh, the administrative burden is high. They have to do a lot of reporting and on and on and on, and much less time for patient care. And I think these things have to change. The environment is also very much now driven by so many need to report and of course economic circumstances. That environment is not always thinking about the wellness of the people they work, they work in. Like many companies too. So mm -hmm. I think you need to wake up as in many other industries to say wellness of our worker is really, really important. Sure. So our action collaborative is to get together all the stakeholders to make this as like a movement, but important we bring together people who are making electronic health record, the insurance companies, and also CMS, Medicare, et cetera, to say, look, some of your rules and regulations are causing way too much burden on a clinician. Can you simplify it, right? I think in last count, an average, um, in organization have to report like 4,000 measurements of quality mm -hmm. because they deal with different insurance companies, each one measures something differently, they deal with this or that, and they're just way too much. And of course, as people who, patients will know, you go and see a doctor, they spend five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, the rest of the time they spend the computer. One of our studies showed that for an average internal medicine physician, the time they spend, 30% with patients, the rest of the time is actually paperwork, mm. right? So these things have to change. Sure. We are looking very much and looking at saying change the system to make a much better working environment. It's a fascinating situation and it's, uh, we find ourselves in, but uh, as you hey, said. Hey, Ira, yeah. that's why I love working National Academy. That's what we do. We look at problems that's facing the nation or globally. We gather the right people together. We try to make a difference. And, um, and that's what we try to profile on the show. And uh, Thank people you. like you making a difference, uh, moving the, the story forward. Um, and, you know, I, I want to say thank you now because not just for, for coming on the show, but for everything that you do in terms of spreading awareness, putting together these coalitions, getting the theme of healthy longevity out there so that, uh, you know, things will exponentially go. Uh, at the same time, thank you for, for still well, working in the lab on the, on the next generation. Yeah. Uh, of, well, of you know, I tell you what, we're very lucky because for those who don't know about National Academies, uh, it a, has a long history. Mm -hmm. M. Lincoln and Congress founded National Head of Science as the foundational academy. And there was time during Civil War when they say, just like even now, we need independent advice and mm -hmm. political advice. We need scientists, we need evidence. And so they founded this academy, which is not part of the government, but close to government, right. independent entity. That's the good news. And for 150 years, the government, the Congress have always come to us to say, what do we do in this area? What do we do in that area? Even now with the change of administration, we continue to get requests from the government, FDA, CDC, mm -hmm. and or Congress to say, this is an important health area. Tell us what we need to do. Sure. And because of years of, of our work, we have, we're trusted, we are authoritative, and we have evidence-based, we're independent, and that's why we're able to do what we do. So my feeling is, in addition to reacting to the needs of the government, we need to understand the needs of the public. Sure. The nation is more than the government. So that's why we're taking on many of these projects to be actively trying to figure out how to solve this. The good news is because of our reputation, we can get the best minds to come and work with us. Even in our membership alone, we have 70 some Nobel laureates. So, mm. so the quality of the people we work with. So we get the best minds and say, hey, this is a big problem in this country. Let's try to solve this together. We're trying. 
and and they have a great mind leading it in you. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, once again, um, for everybody that uh, is going to be watching uh, on the channel or listening on the various podcast networks, we've been spending time with the amazing Dr. Victor Zhao, President of the United States National Academy of Medicine of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Uh, go to their website, uh, take a look at the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity, the Healthy Longevity Global Competition for anyone out there that uh, is in a lab right now that has great ideas, cutting edge ideas and, and, and get them to Dr. Zhao and his team because uh, this is really the way that we're all going to move this big problem of uh, longevity and aging forward. And once again, Dr. Zhao, thank you for taking Ira, the time I out may. of your schedule. Hey, Ira, so, we are actually announcing within the next two weeks, we're open for application. Excellent. So people are welcome to put in, uh, we'll give you the guidance, two page, not long application of bold ideas. We have a whole slew of reviews ready to go. And so in January, I don't know the exact date, but soon it'll be open for six weeks for people to send in applications. After which we go into review mode. And by May, we announce the winners and they'll get the money in July. And that will be our first round. And then we're going to repeat that ongoing basis. This is going to happen across the globe. So not only the United States, but also UK, European Union, Japan, you name it. So it's going to be very, very exciting. Outstanding. For those who are listening to this, um, you know, podcast, this uh, interview, uh, pay attention to our website. We'll be announcing the application. It's, uh, tr it's truly amazing stuff, and it's so nice to, to finally see it happening. So, uh, Dr. Zhao, thank you once again thank for, you. for taking the time for, to spend with us. It's a really great Happy New Year to you. Same to you. Take care. Bye-bye.